All right, so we're going to be starting on the etiological considerations. Uh, etiological means the study of knowledge. Interpersonal influences, chapter 62, part two. If in the so-called psychopath, we have a patient profoundly disordered in a specific way, which I have tried to indicate by the term semantic, how we must inquire, did he get this way? Reference has been made to the traditional viewpoint from which it was assumed that inborn organic defect left these people. I'm going to try to read it slow. I got to actually start reading really slow because it's a lot of important information in this chapter when you're dealing with the etiology. So etiology will refer to the cause, the origins of the disease or this condition. I'm sorry, I was thinking of epistemology. That's the study of knowledge. My bad. Etiology is referring to the cause of the origins. My bad. My brain this morning, I'm sorry. Okay, let me start all over again. If in the so-called psychopath, we have a patient profoundly disordered in a, in a specific way, which I have tried to indicate by the term semantic, how we must inquire, did he get this way? Reference have been made to the traditional viewpoint from which it was assumed that inborn organic defect left this people constitutionally inferior or moral imbeciles, etc. Such a congenital defect, it must be readily admitted, may exist and may account for the failure to experience life normally and hence to react sanely. While such a possibility should be excluded from our speculations, I feel that there's a little justification for embracing it as a fact. No neuropathologic or other changes, chemical, histiologic, etc., have been demonstrated as evidence of such a defect. Okay. So this ain't got nothing to do with the changes in chemicals. Histologic, what does that mean? I'm sorry. Histologic. relating to the study of the structure of the cell and tissue seen under a microscope. Histiology, a device for looking at small, small objects. A histological study is a microscopic study of tissue or organs. So basically he's just talking about the biology. We go in more molecular. Well, that's more in a cellular sense. But chemically, we'll be dealing with the molecular, right? And then in, 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 in even microscopically, so he's dealing with tissues now. So you could, well, he's dealing with the cell before it becomes a tissue. So I'm just going to say cellular or a microscopic view of the cells. They're saying, he's saying that this. Let's keep reading, Cornelius. These are these will refer to the neuropathologic. And I was telling y'all that slaves had these neuropathologies from slavery, right? And it was passed on through epigenetics. Okay. He's saying that these neuropathologic, whether the changes be in chemical or histiologic have no, not been demonstrated as evidence of such a defect. 
and these defects of being having these inborn organic defects in you, whether you become constitutionally inferior. But we know that we can't base everything on his opinion because the conditions of slavery were so great that it did pass down uh, these genetical traits down to the offspring where they had just had this like inborn sense of inferiority in them. Uh, and they became like moral imbeciles in certain sense. And it was with the white people as well. I'll give you an example of this. There's a book that I read a little while, some years ago. If you're interested in reading about imbecil imbecilic behavior in families, uh, this is a book called the, the Calicac Family. This is a study of the heredity of feeble-mindedness, though this also existed among white people as well. If you're interested in reading about imbeciles in the white communities. And this was first published in 1912. It was an infamous study helped to establish this family and the eugenics movement back in that time period when they were studying the branches of pseudo uh, anonymous anyways. But we're back on this book right now. Stay focused, Cornelius. I'm just trying to help myself understand why he's now saying that this doesn't have any this neuropathologies or other changes in chemical or histiologic that cell microscopic etc have been demonstrated as evidence of such a defect no neuropathologic well how is that not demonstrated as evidence okay so they just haven't been able to successfully demonstrate it as evidence it doesn't mean that this isn't the influence such evidence may be discovered and if so may support this assumption still so popular among psychiatrists the belief once almost universal that these constitutional inferiors came from families loaded with stigma they call it stigmata or degenerations and signs of neuropathic taint, etc. Finds no confirmation from the observations reported here. It is worthwhile for us to remember also that statistical studies giving evidence of hereditary factors are notoriously fallible. Even the apparently overwhelming proof of such an explanation obtained in comparative studies of the Jukes and the Jonathan's Edwards families does not stand up under subsequent examinations as particularly convincing. I have seen little if any more evidence that the psychopath inherited his qualities from antecedents than that such factors are the chief determinants of the psychoneuroses and the orthodox psychosis. Okay, I can accept that. So he's saying that he hasn't seen any evidence that the psychopath is more evident in heredity in antecedents or heredity than his orthodox psychosis, his obvious organic schizophrenia or the psychoneuroses. It has been argued from by some that the psychopath's typical symptoms appear in his earlier years and that this along with the usual persistence of his disorder despite treatment indicates that the disorder is therefore constitutional in the sense of being inborn. This argument carries weight and deserves consideration. On the other hand, as pointed out by Prue, there is abundant evidence that environmental influences very early in life are major factors in the development of behavioral patterns. But this contradicts what he just said over here about the no neuropathologic or other changes, chemical or histiology, etc., has been demonstrated as evidence of such a defect. 
of an assumed inborn organic defect that has left these people constitutionally inferior or moral imbeciles. Now he jumps over here and says, on the other hand, as pointed out, that there is abundant evidence that environmental influences very early in life are major factors in the development of behavioral patterns. So y'all see the contradictions? So he's not being honest. So I'm suspicious about everything else he's going to say in this book. Uh, I, I guarantee you it was environmental factors and genetical track uh, factors, inborn factors of these psychopaths has to do with these treatment, how they were treated as a child. But the end, it was already inborn in them as, as well. So anyways, let me just keep reading because I feel myself getting distracted. Smoke. I'm not basing everything about this book. There's other studies that you can find that proves that environment, along with genetics, play a role in all of these. The same observer notes that assuming our therapeutic failures to prove that the etiology is hereditary and unmodifiable is flattering to psychiatry, but fallacious in view of our far from perfect record el elsewhere. Proulx's analysis of the problem is succinct interesting without signs of the strong bias so often encountered in this area. Constitutional is sometimes used to imply what is very deep-seated or nuclear without assuming that this is necessarily hereditary or altogether a static inborn defect. To say many, however, the word automatically invokes concepts of congenital deficiencies or other rigidly laid down and unmodifiable patterns of behavior that it is likely to inject unproved assumptions in a problem already sufficiently complex. A few years ago, numerous observers reported reports of electroencephalographic abnormalities in psychopaths. This was welcomed by many as more or less conclusive evidence of an organic disorder. Subsequent, subsequent studies failing to confirm this finding strongly indicate that evidence of electroencephalographic abnormalities, EE scans, and this is a measurement of electrical activity in part of the brain, is by no means established in the psychopath. Though many psychiatrists today, like Campbell, maintain strong conviction that disorders of this sort is primarily the expression of neurologic or organic pathologies. I believe that while this explanation deserves every consideration as a possibility, there is little to support it as a definite conclusion and insufficient evidence to indicate it as a strong probability. If a moment of speculation along this line is allowed, we may say here that great differences of potentiality, whether intellectual or emotional, seems probable among human beings. And these differences, it seems reasonable to believe, lie very susceptibilities to failure or the psychiatric disorder or to psychiatric disorders. Such susceptibilities are not necessarily defect or intrinsically negative qualities. May not superior emotional response contribute to a boy's developable, developing Oedipal attachments that can prove crippling in the degree to which he has capacity for loyalty? May not the 
the precociously brilliant child because of his advancement encounter, encounter deep personal and social problems early than early than the average and sustained trauma that he might have avoided with additional experiences. Such experience may be available to the mediocre who in his slower progress meets the confusing situation a little later. Those whose feelings are highly developed are more susceptible to hurt than others. The goal of the superior person often demand of him and of the world what the average never has to face. Disillusioning, disillusion and suffering because of frustrations escaped by most of his fellows may, in the child of great talent and potentiality, stimulate attitudes of withdrawal and cynical rejections or other pathologic reactions. Exceptional talent or capacity seems almost regularly to call for exceptional achievement or fulfillment to put the subject under extraordinary responsibility and into situations particularly complex. Courage and in initiative lead man not only to the to take physical risks, but also into subjective ventures of many sorts with many dangers. What we value in some as steadfastness probably arises from potentialities that through different shapes, shaping emerges in others as incorrigibility in elasticity, or perhaps as those elements which may make a psychiatric disorder irre irreversible, obstinacy, incorrigibility, granting the likelihood of great variations in the basic potentialities of the organism. Let us, for, for, let us not forget that in so complex a matter, a personality maturation and social adjustment not only defects, but talents also may contribute to conflict to confusions, to distortions of the life patterns, and perhaps to serious clinical disorders. Even if substantial evidence should arise to indicate important inborn causes for the disorder, we call semantic or, or other psychiatric syndromes, we should scarcely be justified to in ignoring the tremendously important shaping forces of the Malou which operates continually from birth to death. Noye's comparisons of the inborn potential for ours in the mind and the psychogenic factors with the processes by which this is made into machinery seems apt and this is worth bearing in mind. Though obvious, it is perhaps also well to emphasize the fact that distinctions between organic and psychogenic are sometimes far from absolute. Organic changes in the organism must occur not only in the psychopath, the schizophrenic and the hysterical patient, but in all people in response to every item of experience. He who learns French gets married dissects a candor, it's frightened by a dog, or looks up if a new word in the dictionary can scarcely be conceived of as emerging from a synaptic pattern, synaptic pattern of nervous systems entirely unchanged. It would not be profitable to confine our concepts of what is organic to the cellular level with so much already known, which indicates that molecular and submolecular changes are regularly resulting from our acts of learning, or if one prefers, from all of our conditioning. He who has ever known a miser, an honest man, a bigot, a golf enthusiast, or a person who genuinely loves another, will not have to be told that such changes can be enduring. The most impressive point suggesting that inborn factors play a major role in the psychopath's disorder. In my opinion, it is the observation that the same pattern of maladaptation extends back into early years of life. This is a frequently mentioned characteristic. In some patients studied personally, 
have been reported as showing even in infancy, rather typically deviated behaviors. And others, however, as in crepillian dementia precox, only good or superior adjustments occurred until adolescence came with its familiar storms. Still, others have shown little to indicate such a pattern until later, a few not until adult years. In view of the facts that immature behavior and attitudes of relative irresponsibilities are commonly seen in children and adolescents, it is often difficult to determine precisely when a seriously pathologic pattern began. Parents are frequently unaware of the antisocial or delinquent behavior in their children, and accurate histories have been difficult to obtain. Wishes and hopes may distort observations by those personally concerned, and the patient himself is seldom to be reclined upon for a factual account. Whether as a result of congenial factors of a very early and very severe interactions with the milieu, it is characteristic of the disorder to appear early and usually to persist relatively unmodified by therapeutic influences. This is true of those patients in whom the pattern has been long established and whom we think of as shown the full manifestations. There are, however, many who, in episodes of varying lengths during maturation, fulfill temporarily all the diagnostic criteria. Those who clear up we do not usually call psychopaths. There is nevertheless reason to feel in them the same pattern of disorder occurred in milder degree, but did not progress or become fixed and irreversible. Not so many years ago, dementia precox was gener generally believed to be a psychiatric disorder, being at puberty and regularly persisting and progressing. Now that psychiatry, psychiatry deals with people throughout the community rather than that only such a group as those committed to state hospitals 40 years ago, we see that schizophrenic reactions are often brief episodes and that many begin this particular pathologic pattern but not follow it the course charted by Kremlin. And this has taught us that some points once believed essential to a description of schizophrenia, though still pertinent to the selected group of those who don't get well, fail in their application to schizoid illness as a whole. In my opinion, it is likely that the other pathologic responses to life, which we call semantic disorder also occurs often in those who recover or who develop only part of the clinical syndrome and who therefore not meaning meeting our present diagnostic criteria are not considered to the formulation of our conception. In this connection, it is interesting to recall a young woman who, after having both manic and depressive illnesses, developed behavioral, wonderfully a uh, behavior developed behavior wonderfully typical of the classic psychopath. Without euphoria, increased psychomotor activity, excitement, unusual talkativeness, or any other characteristic of even you know, mild manic reactions, she calmly behaved with a complete disregard for her former evaluation. Like the psychopath, she verbally and theoretically showed sane and appropriate reactions. Her illness promptly turned terminated with shock therapy. Perhaps one should not say that this patient was for a few weeks a psychopath, but she did appear to react not in the familiar manic or depressive pattern, but in a behavior perfectly consistent with semantic disorders and with that picture only. Surveying the information available on our patient, many incidents emerged which can which one can presume might have been seriously traumatic or distorting, which perhaps played a casual role in their maladaptations. Not a few of the typical experiences reported in psychoanalytic literature as significant appear as we review these histories. Similar incidences appear in the background of other patients and of course, in the background of healthy and happy people 
events of the sort which one feels might account for psychopathologies are available, but just what these meant to the patient, how much and in what, in what way they influenced him seem to be particularly difficult to evaluate in those whose disorders is semantic. It has not usually been possible to put together in a dynamic and consistent pattern the event, the personal reactions to it, the development of a pathological adaptative scheme that satisfactorily explains the picture we see. The opinion has already been expressed that this is not always successfully done with patients with other types. The psychopath, however, seems present in particular difficult. Often experiences reported by the patients are proved later to be falsehoods. Screen memories, however, unfactual, are considered of significant and by some as having significance comparable to that of actual an event. In the typical psychopath, it is, however, hard not to be skeptical about one's accuracy in evaluating either the real experiences or those he reports which did not occur. Others and better methods with those available in the present studies have succeeded in producing far satisfactory dynamic explanations, considering the experiences of our colleagues to whom some of these patients were referred for analytic investigations and therapy. It still seems to me that they are less regularly accessible by any method by their patients, but Partridge expressed long ago still seems pertinent. He says, in quote, Notoriously, the psychopath has eluded analytic analy analysis in a strict sense. The urge to cure or reconstruct the urge to cure or reconstruction does not enter into his realm of desires. So he's in therapy, but he has no urge to cure or for reconstruction. And this is not entering into his desires as he's sitting there telling you about his problems and his childhood. He has genuinely rationalized his conduct so that he accepts himself well, is pleased with his manifest attainments and methods so that we may say that the psychopath is one whose conduct is satisfactory to himself and to no one else, okay? So he has his own ethics. The nature of the psychopath disorder, the lost elements of reactivity, which do not enter at semantic level into his behavior, account for much of the difficulty in getting at the sort of information by which we might be adequately interpreting, interpreted in dynamic terms. Another difficulty lies in the way of one's attempt to evaluate his early life situation through what one can learn from and about his parents and siblings, etc. The difficulty here, though not confined to cases of this sort, lies in how often families may appear to the community and to themselves happy, successful, and well adjusted, and yet in their inmost interpersonal relations lack something exceedingly important, like this family here. If you're interested in what these families he's referring to, these are these feeble-minded people. In the patient present presented here, social service reports and all ordinary information usually indicate normal and helpful family attitudes and general environments. The families themselves often impress the examiner as good, healthy, wise, and eminently well-adjusted people whose children were particularly fortunate because of what they could offer as parents. When opportunities arose, as they sometimes did, to learn more of matters inward, subtle, and deeply personal, one was frequently led to suspect and sometimes to believe that even in these apparently superior parents, there were attitudes, frustrations, emotional confusions, and deficiencies that might have played a masked but crucially adverse role in the infinite complexities and paradoxes of parent-child relations. This is not to say that the parents were wrongly judged as conscious or a superior people, or that in many important respects they were not well adjusted. Despite 
consciousness, conscientious, conscientiousness, and a good deal of wisdom and success. Characteristics may exist which subtly but trenchantly distort the milieu of an infant or a child. People may be fair, kind, gentle, may hold entirely normal or even admirable attitudes about all important matters and yet unknowingly lack a simple warmth, a capacity for true intimacy that seems to be essential for biologic soundness. In some basic relationships, there are men and women of whom it might correctly be said that it is important for them ever to be become really personal. This aspect or ingredient of human experience is difficult to, to describe or to satisfy accurately. We do not encounter it squarely in thinking, but feel it in perceptive modes or at reactive levels, not readily translatable into speech. Like a familiarity, like how oh, I feel like you've known somebody in another lifetime. Some who show only superior qualities in all of their activities as citizens in their work and in all definable responsibilities feel little need for the sort of specific attachments and effective close, closeness, which perhaps constitutes the core of deep and genuine love. Why is that, I wonder? They also seem to have little perception of such a deep need in others. Are you trying to say that the more successful people are less empathetic? There are people who show in ch changeless formality, poise and cool, sensible attitudes, outer indications of what is being discussed, but it is not they who concern us at present. And others, genial, in formality and manifestations of more than ordinary warmth may prevail in relatively superficial friendships and routine social contacts and professional and business associations at dinner parties and at club meetings. Where intimacy is normally limited they may be spontaneous and show cordiality as real as anything appropriate for such occasion. Their inner formalities and remoteness is not encountered until the observer approaches areas of privacy, deep levels of personal affect that ordinarily are only reached in relations between mates, between parents and child, or in a few other very intimate and cherished friendships or sharings of personal understanding and feelings that man never achieves in wholesale lot. Parents of this sort are likely to give a universal impression of affording each other and the child all that is ideal and affording it in abundance. One such parent will, however, leave the other so deprived in essential needs that the child may be turned to for the exclusive and possessive intimacy norm, normal between mates, but full of pathologic potentialities in other relations. The observations reported by Kaner in the study of infantile autism magnificently illustrate what is being discussed here, something very difficult to convey in generalities. Let us turn for a moment to what Kainer was noted in his autistic infant and in their parents. The obvious and extreme emotional isolation of the patients need not be fully described here. Some of these intelligent children remain literally mute despite in an excellent command of language which they display in emergencies. The withdrawal and loss of personal relations are apparently as profound as in adult schizophrenia, uh, then Kainer says, end quote. The infant seems unusually apathetic. Do not react to the approach of people, fail to assume and anticipated anticipatory posture preparatory to being picked up and when they are picked up they do not adjust their posture to the person who holds them 
They shrink from anything that encroaches on their isolation. Persons, noise, moving objects, and often even food. They seem happiest when left alone. It is, he encounters, customary to evaluate the hereditary element in the schizophrenic. Such an inquiry into the ancestral background of autistic children is entirely fruitless if one limits oneself to overtly psychotic or hospitalized relatives. It is even more remarkable that almost all adult relatives have been rather successful in their chosen careers. The fathers are scientists, college professors, artists, clergymen, business executives. There are a few psychologists and psychiatrists among them. Many of the fathers, grandfathers, and uncles are listed in some of the who's who compilations are in American Men's of Science. All but five of the mothers of the five of the 55 children have attended college. All but one have been active vocationally before some after marriage had were scientists, laboratory technicians, nurses, physicians, librarians, and artists. Quote, my search for autistic children of unsophisticated parents, Kaner says, has been unsuccessful to date. Oh, he should, he should have just went over into the Negro community. That's a plethora. <laughs> this astounding fact has been created a curiosity about the personalities of the parents, their attitudes and resulting behaviors toward the patients and the possible relationships between these factors and the presence and structures of the children's psychopathologic manifestations. It is worth our while to follow in some detail, Kana remarks, well expressions observed observations about the parents, not of psychopaths, let us remember, but of these autistic children, he says, in quote. Nevertheless, aside from the indisputably high level of intelligence, the vast majority of the parents of the autistic children have features in common which it would be impossible to disregard. The outstanding attributes may be summed up as follows. I'm, I'm interested. One is struck again and again by what I should like to call a mechanization of human relationships. This is roboticness that I've been telling y'all that I've been noticing in my environment. Most of the parents declare outright that they are not comfortable in the presence of people. That's that schizoid personality. They prefer reading, writing, painting, making music, or just thinking. Those who speak of themselves as sociable tend to qualify this by explaining that they have no use for ordinary chatter. They are, on the whole, polite and dignified people who are impressed by seriousness and disdainful of anything that smacks of frivolity. They describe themselves and their marital partners as undemonstrative. This ad Objective and all of this implies it is not offered apologetically by the parents as it refers to himself or herself, nor in any way critical as it refers to the spouse. That just under the demonstrative. Often parents of other children brought because of emotional problems complain with some bitterness about the husband's or wife's lack of outward show of affection. The parents of autistic children do not seem to mind. Matrimonial life is a rather cold and formal affair. There is no glamour of romance in premarital courtship, no impetuousness in postnuptial mating. On the other hand, there are no major animosities. There's only been one separation or divorce of any of the 55 couples examined. The parents treat each other with faultless respect, talk things over calmly and earnestly, and give to outsiders the impression of mutual loyalty. So far as can be ascertained, there are no extramarital sex relations, no 
one father, Randy Abdu, much persuasion to yield to the temptation of an amateur actress, suddenly found himself impotent. He went home, told his wife about it, and it was she who, without rancor, asked me for suggestions in a long distance telephone call. The parents' behavior toward the children, Kaner says, must be seen to be fully appreciated. Maternal lack of genuine warmth is often conspicuous at the time of the first visit to the clinic. As they come up the stairs, the children trail forlornly behind the mother who does not bother to look back. The mother accepts the invitation to sit down in the waiting room while the children sit, stand or wander about at a distance. Neither make a move toward the other. Later in the office, when the mother is asked under some pretext to take the child on her lap, she usually does so in a dutiful, stilted manner, holding the child upright and using her arms solely for the mechanical purpose of maintaining the child in his position. I saw only one mother of an autistic child who proceeded to embrace him warmly and bring her face close to him. Some time ago, I went to see an autistic child the son of a brilliant lawyer in a small town in Mississippi. I spent an evening with the family. Donald, the patient, sat down next to his mother on the sofa. She keep moving away from him as though she could not bear the physical proximity. When Donald moved along with her, she finally told him coldly to go and sit in a chair. There are profoundly important matters, Kaner, and, and that's the end of that. God, you can kind of see the behavior of these parents. These are profoundly important matters. Kenner is not talking about psychopaths, but what we report is so pertinent and conveys so much about realities that do not come readily through words that it will be of value to quote him further. So he, he says more about this. Many of the fathers hardly know their autistic children. They are outwardly friendly, admonish, teach, they observe objectively, but rarely step down from the pedestal of sober adulthood to indulge in child, childish play. One father, a busy and competent surgeon, had three children. The first, a girl, was docile and submissive and gave no cause for concern to the parents. The second was a boy, was very insecure and stuttered badly. The third, George, was an extremely withdrawn, typically autistic child. The father wanted who once told me profoundly that he never wasted time talking to the patient's relatives, did not see anything wrong with George, who was merely a little slow and would catch up eventually. When nothing could shake his smiling and passive passiveness, I tried to arouse his anger by asking him if he would recognize any of his children if they passed out on a busy street. Far from being irked, he deliberated for a while and replied, just as impassively, that he was not sure that he would. This seemingly unemotional objectivity implied, applied to oneself and to others is a frequent expression of the mechanizations of human relations. <sighs> Great. Oh my God, where am I at? Oh 
Oh my God, I'm almost done, guys. Literally one page left and the devil's trying to confuse me right now. Where am I at? Let me just skip to, let me skip. Canner's observation about the parents of patients with infantile autisms have not been emphasized for the purpose of identifying autisms with what we have called semantic disorders. The parents of the patients to whom this volume is devoted have not regularly shown evidence of what Kaner has so illuminated, clearly illuminated. There is, however, reason for me to feel that degrees of central coolness, combinations and variations of what has just been discussed and particularly more deeply masked but essentially similar attitudes have played a part in the early environment of a large proportion of patients who, when we see them 20 years later, react as psychopaths. So he's making a link on a social, right? Let us again say of the autism, these kids with autism compared to the them 20 years later growing up with psychopaths, there's no difference in their childhoods. Let us again say that what influences we find reason to believe or to suspect had etiologic effects on the children. So that we refer to origins or the cause, so more hereditary, inborn effects of the children who emerged as psychopaths seem distinguished not by obvious features, but by a mixed disguised and complex nature. Like narcissism would be a form of this sort of disguised complex nature of the etiologic effects of these children growing up, uh, these psychopathic ideations emerging in this person. No parents being perfect, obviously, it is true that the early environment of all people would probably show under adequate examinations many factors of pathogenic significance. An event or specific effect of influence must be considered not only per se, but in relation to what has gone before and what follows. The accident of, of timing may be crucial and ostensibly trivial consequences and cumulative effect may become major and sinister subjective events, though invisible or almost invisible from without. Walking across the street doesn't ordinarily prove fatal, but sometimes a child while crossing the street may hesitate to look up at an airplane just as the man driving the car, man driving the car turns his head for a moment in response to what is disclosed at the curb where a gust of wind blows up a girl's skirt. The disorder we have called semantic is presented as a subtly pathologic reaction, which does not appear in what one sees on the surface. The influences and impossible influences from the environment would seem most likely to have played a causative role have rather characteristically also been not grossly or readily discernible as such but arcane, hard to elicit, and one would think therefore particularly confusing to him who must deal with them. <laughs> yes, it's very confusing, but that's the mastery of this matrix. And that's how they designed it. These are the templates. I was just reading it to help y'all understand it. I hope it was comprehensible. Uh, God gave me the energy to get through it without a lot of mistakes. And I'm going to keep reading this book on the mass of sanity. Cliquey. Is this done? Come on. <laughs>